You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. It is season three, episode 13. Pakoda hates the Cubs 2024 edition. Don't forget to listen, download, review, most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on the socials, Fly the W670 on Twitter, Instagram. Of course, we're on Facebook, and you can email us. That's right, fly the W at 670 at fly the W670 at gmail.com. Crowley, hope you enjoyed uh, Big Game Sunday. Hope you maybe had a square, had a pop, had a snack. I definitely had a pop, but I didn't hit a square and I didn't hit any of my props. So I'm, I'm, I'm just glad it's over. It's done. Welcome everybody back to the cub train. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's about to get rolling. You know, we're, we're, we're only a few days away from pitchers and catchers reporting. And so needless to say, it, it is an exciting time. Exciting time to be a Cubs fan. And a, quite a handful of guys are already out in Arizona. Good to see these guys are taking it serious. Well, I think things have changed recently when, um, you know, they, the Cubs a few years ago, they started to invite prospects to kind of come out earlier and house them there and stuff like that. And so I think what, what players and both uh, management have realized is that you have state of the art facilities at Sloan. This is not the old school Cubs, uh, you know, spring training where, where Crane Kenny used to joke, they used to have, they used to bring the weights on the moving truck from Wrigley to Mesa. Yeah. That's not the case anymore. You you go there and you get straight state of the art workout equipment. Your your trainers are there. Your coaches are there, and and so I know a lot of players that 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 live in the area now because of that, and so they're there a lot of the time. That place is humming twenty four seven three hundred sixty five in Sloan Park. I mean, all the facilities they have it just makes sense. So it's open all the time. Guys are can use it anytime they want. Good to go. Right. And, and so that, that's the key. And so I think a lot of players are taking advantage of that. Uh, like you said, uh, you know, looking at our friends, G, uh, Rich Biesterfeld and John Antonoff, they're, they're on Twitter and they've been just sending pictures and it, it, I'm, I'm more surprised at who's not there. Do you get what I'm saying? It's like, right. th- there's more people there than not there right now. Right. Right. More people. N- yeah. More people at home that are, haven't shown up yet than they actually there at camp. Yeah. Pretty interesting. I mean, that's good. That's such a good tone. Right. And I'm sure, uh, Craig Council and uh, and Jed and they've set that tone, so that's good. Right, and, and you know what? It's fun to be out there. It's beautiful. I, I can't wait till I'm out there. And for for those of you who are not familiar with spring training, Dustin, the camp is divided into two. Right, so you have what's called major league and minor league camp, and so the Cubs' forty man roster and any non roster invitees are divided from the minor leaguers. Now, if you're following this on uh, 670, the score, you, uh, the YouTube page, if you go to Mesa and you're looking at spring training, it's divided up. And the way that it's divided up is field one and field two is for the big league squads. And you can go along the first base side of field one and you can watch the minor leaguers hit, but it's, it's a little bit more isolated where they do their warm ups and stretches and where they kind of do some of the drills. The 40, the major league camp is a little bit different. Whereas, so if you're looking up here, that would be, you have Sloan park and then there's like a walkway and the walkway leads to the performance facility where the workouts is. Field one is where you can see a lot of the players that you all know and love, Dansby Swanson, Nico Horner. They'll hit on field one, and then they also have field two. But field two is very hard to get to and very hard to see. And where they warm up is kind of off limits. You can't really see that there. It's very difficult if you don't have access. And so that's the major league, the 40-man roster and the sprint and the non-roster invitees. All the rest of the minor league camp goes into the backfields is what it's called. It looks like a four leaf clover and there's four baseball fields and home plate is almost touching on each of them. And there's an area kind of a circular area surrounding with benches and anyone can just, you can go down there and sit there. And if you want to see some of the young guys, if you want to see Cade Horton, or if you want to, you know, you want to see some of the younger players, you can easily go to these backfields. That's where I meet a lot of these guys for years and years. So it's two different camps that are kind of going on at the same time. So if you get out to spring training, it's a lot of fun. And so the the backfields is, like I said, four-leaf clover. They're going to work on different hitting, pitching, or fielding drills. But Dustin, the the non-roster invitee list that the Cubs just released, um, there's going that a non-roster invitee is an invitation for a player who's not on the club's 40-man roster to attend major league camp in spring training and compete for a roster spots. 
So clubs can sometimes extend their non-roster invitees to the upper level minor leaguers. So there's going to be some guys that, whose names you recognize. You're like, oh, they're already with the Cubs. There's going to be other guys that were signed to minor league contracts with the opportunity to do spring training with the big club and try to turn some heads and get some eyeballs, right? And so the Cubs this week released that and this last week, and it includes 19 players, Dustin, that have a chance to break with the club. And for some of these guys, Dustin, it's, it's, they realize the importance of it because it may not, may be their last opportunity, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, none of these, you know, the guys keep getting older, the uh, young guys coming up, keep getting bigger, taller, faster. Right. So you got to take every uh, opportunity you can. And that's probably another reason why these guys get out there as fast as they do. And I think the Cubs are looking for somebody that, you know, just might have a little bit of magic left in them that, that, you know, something left in the tank that, uh, you know, People remember Miles Michaelis. He went to Japan mm-hmm. and he came back with the Cardinals. And that's what they're looking for is to try to find somebody. One guy that's trying to still make it, Carl Edwards Jr. There's 11 pitchers invited to this camp. Carl Edwards Jr. is one of them, the string being slinger. We talked about how he was on the mound in the 10th inning of game seven, got two outs. Dustin, CJ came from the to the Cubs from the Texas Rangers in 2013 when the Cubs traded Matt Garza. Remember that? Yeah. For uh, remember that stupid goatee? I, I don't know. Um, I remember he, the nuns, the nuns wearing it, right? It was a giveaway and the nuns were wearing the Matt Garza, right? Yeah. Yeah. They had the little soul patch, whatever yeah. that was. Uh-huh. And so CJ came along with Justin Grimm, Neil Ramirez and Mike Alt, who was your opening day, third baseman, 2015. He made it ahead of Chris Bryant. For those of you who remember that far back, but you know, when, when you think about Carl, he was traded to the Padres in 2019. He played for Seattle in 2020, the Braves and the Blue Jays in 2021. In the last two seasons, he's been with the Nationals and he was looking really good, but injuries cut short his 2023 season. And now he's back with the Cubs. So this is a type of guy that you're going to kind of take a look at and say, okay, maybe maybe Carl has something left in the tank, you know? Yeah. And why Cup- not, right? Why not? Right. Now, uh, I, Dustin, I'm sure you remember this story. Ethan Roberts got an invitation, a non-roster invitee to the big league camp. Remember that spring training moment after he came out of the game? I'd say it was for the against the White Sox. And then manager David Ross told him he made the roster and he they caught him on marquee. He just kind of started mm-hmm. crying. He I was so yep. overwhelmed. And he looked so good in April, but he was put on the IL in early May with right shoulder inflammation, which would require Tommy John surgery in June. So he's been rehabbing from that surgery for a couple of years, for about a year and a half now. He was non-tendered by the Cubs this last November. So he was off the 40-man roster, but he did resign with the Cubs in December. He's on track to pitch in 2024. So it's going to be interesting to see what Ethan Roberts has. Yeah, another good name. You know, you can't ever have enough good pitching, right, Crowley? I mean, there's just not enough. You can never have too many. And, and right now, the Cubs have plenty of guys that might be the closer, but who knows? You never know where these guys might come out of nowhere and end up being, you know, a high leverage guy because they know it's their last uh, time around. Now, one of the Cubs players that came from the Cubs system, and he was a guy that I told everyone to look out for last year, and it just didn't come together. But I still truly believe in this kid, Cam Sanders. He was the Cubs 12th round pick in 2018. He's a son of former Cubs, Scott Sanders. He pitched his first full season in Iowa last year after climbing the major minor league ladder. Dustin, he's got an electric arm with high velocity fastball and a wipeout slider. It just has to come down to de- decreasing the walks. And you know that walks are going to kill you out of the bullpen in the major leagues. You can't do it. And so, Dustin, last this is kind of the tale of Cam Sanders. Last season, he appeared in 51 games. He had 97 strikeouts in 51 games, but he also had 69 walks. Yeah. We can't do that. No, you know, so, can't, so, can't, you cannot give away, <laughs> you can't give away those free bases. Uh, so, you know, it'd be interesting to see what he has, but if he can put it together, I mean, th- this is a guy that I'm just always kind of had my eye on. So I'm hoping that this is the year that it all kind of comes together. Uh, Dustin, we talked about a couple of these guys, Richard Lovelady and, and Thomas Pannon are a couple of guys that have bounced around They're lefties. And I think that's what the Cubs really are looking at right now is some of these lefties to help fill out the bullpen. But they also, if you remember, one of the first signings they made this season was Edwin Escobar. He was once a top prospect for the Rangers. He had a couple of cups of coffee with the Red Sox in 2014 and the Diamondbacks in 2016. And then in 2017, he heads to Japan 
where he's been pitching ever since. And so they saw him when they were scouting uh, Yamamoto and Imanaga and all of these things, all these different players, and they saw Escobar over there, and so they decided to give it a shot here. Dustin, how about this? When Edwin Escobar was in Japan, do you know who he was teammates with? Shota Imanaga. Uh, okay. All with right. the Yokohama Bay Star. So maybe, I don't know, Edwin, maybe he speaks some Japanese. He's been there for seven years, but at least they have to be familiar with each other. So yeah, that's another that's cool. familiar face. Right. That's, that's another familiar face. That's really cool. Yeah, I like that. Now, one guy that I think Cub fans may have forgotten is Brad Week. Um, Week got the invite, and ironically, we were talking about Carl Edwards. The Cubs traded Carl Edwards to the Padres and got Week in return from San Diego. He was a weapon out of the bullpen for the Cubs in 2021. He allowed zero runs over 17 innings and struck out 28 across 15 relief appearances, but he's missed the last few seasons with Tommy John surgery. So again, a guy like Brad Week, if, if he can do what he did before, he's going to maybe give somebody a, he's going to challenge for a job there, right? Right. And plus it's, it's no investment on the Cubs part, right? I mean, there's no. not, there's not a ton of money in this, they're not. No. So you, just two people looking to see if they can get a little uh, baseball love connection, if you will. Right, and they're healthy, and sometimes that can be just all the difference in the world. Uh, Dustin, they, they've asked three infielders to come. One of them does cost you a lot of money, David Bodie. Will we ever forget Bodie's ultimate slam on Sunday Night Baseball Never. for the Nationals? Never. <laughs> I was still, there the, that the stadium game. might still be bouncing, right? Yeah, I was there. It was unbelievable. He made his debut at the Cubs in 2018. He hit that ultimate slam in 2019. But Dustin, you know, he played 127 games in 2019, but then he spent time between Chicago and Iowa in 2021, and that's where he spent most of 2022 and 23. He signed a five-year, $15 million deal in 2020 with the Cubs, but there's a club option in 2025. So if the Cubs want, they can buy him out at the cost of $1 million. If they keep him, they owe him $7 million. So you can figure that this is Bodie's last uh, hurrah with the Cubs here. Yeah, where do you, I mean, where would he fit in? Right. I he, mean, third base, I guess, but they seem like they got a log jam, a kind of sort of third baseman. Yeah. You know, with, with Bodie, I just think that, that he's there and he's just some, they're paying for him. No one else is going to pay for him. So you, right. it's just an insurance piece that you can have. Uh, Chase, Chase Strumpf is another Cubs prospect that's on the infield. But the one that was really surprising to me was Matt Shaw. Um, we talked to Dan Kantrovitz on the last episode with about Matt Shaw. He's popping up all over the third party top hundred prospects in baseball, usually behind PCA and Kate Horton. So people consider him the third best prospect that the Cubs have. He could play shortstop and second. He was the Cubs first round pick out of Maryland in 2023, 13th overall. But Dustin, he said at CubsCon that he spent a lot of time in the offseason working on third base. He flew up the minor league ladder playing three games in the Arizona complex, 20 with South Bend, and he finished the season playing 15 games with the Tennessee Smokies, including starting on that championship team that got the ring. So Matt Shaw, he's not going to break camp with the team, but he's going to have the experience of playing with the older guys, the experienced veterans, um, with all the top tier coaching staff. They're all great coaches, but these are going to be the, the major league coaches that are going to be working with him. Right, and now we're telling you who to keep an eye on, right? I mean, sometimes you, you turn on a, a Cubs spring training game, either on the score or uh, on the Marquee Sports Network, and you're like, who the heck are these guys? Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a little background on these guys and give you a reason to watch them. Yeah, and, and I'm telling you, when Matt Shaw comes on, I'll definitely tweet it out every single time because that's when you want to watch, especially to see what he can do defensively at third because clearly – that's an issue. And Matt Shaw is a college player. So it's not like he's like an 18, 19 year old kid, but you know, he's a college player. And, and if he can play third base, that could really, really help the Cubs. Oh, really? Absolutely. Now, speaking about top 100 prospects, there's only one outfielder non-roster invitee and that's Owen Casey. Uh, Owen was drafted in the second round in 2020 by the Padres. He came to the Cubs in 2021 in the U Darvish trade. He was phenomenal for team Canada in the world baseball classic. Mm -hmm. And he was a key player in the Smokies championship run in 2023 slash in 289, 399, 519. Dustin, he had 22 home runs, 84 RBIs and 120 games left-handed power bat. I mean, well, how now nice in this and Owen Casey might be a name when, you're unhappy right now because the Cubs haven't gotten somewhere with Bellinger yet is that they have a plethora of young outfielders and maybe they just don't want to invest there. 
I mean, maybe that's part of the reason, you know, they don't want to go beyond six, seven years, something right. like that. Right. And, and, and so, yeah, I mean, if Owen, if Owen Casey's not ready in six years, he's never going to be ready. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Owen Casey is one that you're looking at that that's, that's the thing. And like you mentioned, there's a lot of young talent bubbling up and you can't keep them on your minor league rosters forever. You can only protect a certain amount of guys. So right. Owen Casey is definitely someone, what you're doing is you're looking at this window and I think you have three years left of um, Hap and three years left of um, Saya. Right. And so you have a, a large amount of outfielders. You have Brennan Davis is on the 40 man roster, Alexander Canario, Kevin Alcantara, all these guys that are outfielders that are on the 40 man roster and, and other guys that are not, but are going to have to be soon. So that's going to keep uh, things interesting. Now the Cubs did invite four catchers to uh, the major league camp. Jorge Alfaro, camp. Well, somebody's got to catch all these pitchers, Crowley. <laughs> yep. Someone has to catch him. And, and, and what you want to do too, is that again, Jan Gomes older, Miguel Amaya has an injury history. You don't want to be left without a catcher. So they, they signed a couple of veteran guys that have bounced around Jorge Alfaro. He looked like a good hitting catcher and good defensively, but his offensive numbers tanked after 2020. Joe Hudson is a guy that's just never been able to stick to the majors. Um, he's kind of bounced around pretty good defensively, but nothing with the bat, but two young guys in the Cubs system to keep an eye out. Bryce Windham, he he played ball at Old Dominion. He was drafted in 2019 in round 32. He was he's like a true utility player when he came up. He played left, third, first, but he began focusing on catching in 2022. Started doing it full time. He gives you really solid at bats, and pitchers like throwing to him. So Bryce Windham is one of those wild cards to just kind of keep an eye on. The other is a true fan favorite. Everywhere he goes, everybody loves this kid, Pablo Aliendo. He signed as an international free agent and is arguably the Cubs' best defensive prospect at catcher. So his defense is excellent, and everybody thinks he can call a great game. His hitting took a slight dip, obviously. That that jump from, from South Bend to Tennessee is a really tough jump. That Double A's where you really see a lot of your really great players in there. But he was part of the 22 South Bend Championship. He is part of the 2023 Tennessee Smoky Championship. Like I said, defensively and calling pitches, he, he could probably start today as far as the bat. It's just not as caught up as the defense is, but he he's a guy I want to watch. And, and just one other little thing with Pablo, uh, he caught my first pitch that I threw at South Bend. So I'll always have that with Pablo. Ah, the there we go. Now we're getting to the hit harder. I, I, I'm happy for him. And so these are just a couple of players that when you're watching spring training, hopefully you remember some of these names because it's going to be interesting. Very interesting. Indeed. Great, uh, great background there, Carly, on uh, some guys that we really need to be paying attention to as the uh, Cubs pitchers and catchers. By the time we uh, have the next podcast, will all be out there, and then uh, the rest of the team be heading out not too far after that. You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. It is season three. It's episode 13. Pakoda hates the Cubs 2024 edition. Carly, I feel like we've got that on rewind. Don't forget to uh, listen. Download, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast, and don't forget to leave us a five-star review. In this segment, Crowley interviews Craig Goldstein, editor-in-chief of Baseball Prospectus, to discuss the 2024 Cubs Pakota projections. Joining me now on the Fly the W podcast, I'm glad to have back our old friend Craig Goldstein, editor-in-chief of Baseball Prospectus, and he is going to explain to you, the listeners, why Pakota hates the Cubs. Craig, how are you doing today, buddy? Uh, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I was sick last week. St still, you know, people can probably hear it a little bit, but getting better. So, all right, I I'm I'm going to go here, and, and we're going to take a look right away. And and Absolutely. why don't you tell our listeners first what Pakoda stands for and what it does? Uh, what it what it stands for? It's it's a uh, it's a backronym, so people need to understand that it was it was uh, named Pakoda. I mean, this is for this is forever ago. Um, I developed it originally by Nate Silver, who is uh, famous for many other reasons now. Uh, but it is a completely different projection model from when he used to do it. He used to do it, and this is not a this is not a knock. This was these were the tools at the time, but it was in Excel. Those formulas in Excel <laughs> at the time. Uh, right now, Jonathan Judge is is at the controls 
uh, of Pakoda, and we use uh, it's it's a very uh, advanced modeling technique, uh, mixed models, and, and and various things that that uh, go and get involved into it. And so it stands for Player Empirical Comparison and Optimization Test Algorithm. It is named after Bill Pakoda, the the MLB player. Uh, again, Nate Silver named it that, and then again devised a uh, you know something that an acronym to fit that that name uh but we've stuck with it, it it's a, it's a brand it's it's bp's uh projection engine and so people know it and so we've stuck with it um so yeah that's that's what it means uh that, that's what it stands for but it is it's just it's a projection uh, algorithm or, or model much like many other ones that are out there and I think what people have to understand is, and, and you and I just joke about this, you truly don't hate any team. <laughs> you are literally just putting in data and based on historical, you know, player performance and all sorts of things, that's, right. that's exactly what, what it what it spits out. But we know that baseball is a game played by human beings and some players will excel right. and Absolutely. others will take a step back. And then that's not anything anyone can predict. There, correct. There, there are things that models are really good at that humans are not. Uh, extending performance beyond the most recent season or two is one of them, and it weights the most recent seasons more than the than the previous ones. But we kind of lose track as people. Not not everyone, to be clear. But I'm speaking in general generalities here. But we we tend to lose track of of kind of the hist of a player's history and underweight. Uh, certain things or overweight certain things. And the model does better at those things than, than we do. There are things that people do better than any model will do. I, there are things, uh, I, I was talking about this with Vince Gennaro of, of Sirius XM recently, and I was talking about just sticking in the central, Cabrian Hayes. Uh, Cabrian Hayes came back from an injury. And uh, one of our authors wrote about this, Robert Orr, talked about the uh, the, the mechanical changes that he made, um, that that he started lifting the ball to the pull side, which is if you read any modern analysis of hitting right now, that's what you want to be doing if you're looking to add power. It's not the only thing you want to do, but if you're looking to add power, that's what you want. And that's what Cabrian Hayes has missed his entire career. He hits the ball incredibly hard, uh, but he hits he was hitting it to all fields and he hits it on the ground. So now he's lifting the ball based on a mechanical change uh, and and pulling it in the air. And all of a sudden he was hitting for more power. He slugged over 500 after his return from injury. Okay, so there we have some anecdotal evidence, some small sample evidence. Uh, and we have to know that we, you know, that we as humans can see that and can adapt to that and maybe build that into what we think Cabrian Hayes is going to do in the future. But the model only sees the full year. It waits all of those games as much as it waits his first four, you know, the, before the injury. And it doesn't know that there's an anecdotal change, a mechanical change. It knows he performed better in those months, but it's not waiting the latter two months more than the former, you know, than, than the beginning of the season. And sometimes that's the right way to do it. We can get deceived by small sample sizes, but sometimes it's actually uh, the wrong way. When someone makes a change, Spencer Torkelson is another great example of a guy who made a mid-season change that his overall stats don't reflect super well. But we know on that sample size, there was an intentional change. There was a mechanical change and something went, you know, and, and, and things went really well for him after that. So those are just examples of, of what models do that humans, you know, model models might miss that humans are going to catch. But there are a lot of things that humans misestimate that models do a better job with. So let's take a look right now at the 2023 Pakota prediction predictions. You guys had Milwaukee in first place at 87 and Milwaukee, you know, kind of did what Milwaukee did. They took the division, but you had St. Louis at 87 wins, you know, almost the same as Milwaukee. I mean, we're talking yep. about percentage differences here. And then you had the Cubs at roughly 77 wins, Pittsburgh 70, Cincinnati at 66. But when we look at what actually happened, Brewers slightly exceeded at 92, the Cubs slightly exceeded at 83, Cincinnati really exceeded over your models with 82, and, and St. Louis vastly underperformed yep. compared to what the model said. What happened last year, in your opinion, that helped the Cubs 
uh, beat out their projections by a few games all the way up to 83 wins? Well, I think Cody Bellinger, you know, putting up a five win season. Uh, we know he has that latent ability. He obviously hadn't played to that level before. Um, and if you look at kind of the underlying things, I wrote about Bellinger in September of last year. Uh, and I, you know, I, and, and Mike Petriello wrote about this, I think in the off season, uh, Mike Axisa wrote about it at, at CBS sports. Bellinger was a really interesting guy in terms of outperforming his, uh, I don't, I don't want to say his peripherals. His, his stats were really good. And, and, and no one's trying to say that he didn't like, you know, he didn't do it. He didn't earn it. He put those wins up. Right. And, and all those doubles and home runs all counted. And I think they mattered for the Cubs. Uh, but if you look at his average exit velocity, his 90th percentile exit velocity, these kind of things, the home runs that he put up, the extra base hits that he put up outperform or, or, or outperformed what his his kind of combination of launch angle and exit velocity would would have led you to believe. And that that is what our metric DRC plus takes into account. It's some of what it takes into account. Um, and you know, it's, it's what X, you know, X Woba expected stats take into account, things like that. So he's a really interesting guy. Um, I, I still think he was better even on those metrics than, than we would have thought coming into the season, the way he had performed previously, he got healthy. I think the change of scenery helped him that kind of thing. Uh, you know, there are also interesting guys like Christopher Morrell is a really interesting guy. And I think he's a guy uh, in the mold of, and, and again, the, he's not the only one. And, and I, I worry, you know, you, you, we joke about, pe- you know, the, the system hating these teams or whatever. Every system has holes. Uh, that's from people to, to every individual model, things like that, or, or not even holes, but just, uh, you know, guys that are outliers, right? Christopher Morrell uh, swings and misses a lot, doesn't walk a lot. Those are things that our metric DRC plus, which is different than Pakoda, doesn't like. Uh, or, or or is going to count against him. But when he makes contact, it's really hard. And that's really good. And it does value that, right? It doesn't think he's bad. It, I think our DRC plus Adam is a slightly above league average player. But if you look at OPS, what actually happens, you know, something like that, he was better than that. Uh, he performed better than than what our deserved runs created says he, he performed. So you know, you get a number of those guys and you can outperform in, in situations like that. I also think, you know, defense is always hard to quantify. The Cubs, I think we talked about this last year, the Cubs heading into the season, up the middle defense was really, really strong. And I think it was. Dansby Swanson was fantastic. Nico Horner, I mean, deadly up the middle. Cody Bellinger, when he was in center field, played really well there. Obviously, Mike Talkman could play. Pete Crow Armstrong It's going to be really good there if, it, it, you know, if they choose to go with him. Uh, you know, I think some of those things, how those those, uh, I think how defense plays out is is one thing that can really impact a model. I think it can it can impact in a big way, like actual games versus how things project. And and I think honestly, St. Louis is a great example of that. Both historically, we had under projected the Cardinals, and last year was kind of a big correction to to the fact that we projected them fair to be fairly good and if you look at one of the things that really fell apart for them, obviously they're pitching, but their defense, they had been one of the best defensive clubs in baseball for, you know, I don't know how long a decade. And it wasn't just Yadi Molina, although that's part of it. You're talking about up the middle. You're talking about, you know, outfield defense, but Jordan Walker really struggled. You know, Nolan Arenado was good, but not platinum glove. Nolan Arenado uh, shortstop wasn't as defensively strong as it was might be now with Mason Wynn. We'll see, but you know, the, these are the kind of things that play into all of that. Well, let's take you. You guys also had Justin Steele having a good year last year, and he was, you know, mentioned for Cy Young, and and so again, certain guys are going to outperform, and certain guys are going to regress, and that's kind of part of it. So let us look at the 2024 Pagoda projections right now. How the hell does St. Louis get back to number one? 85 wins. Chicago with 80. Milwaukee 78. Cincinnati 78, and Pittsburgh 73. Now I'm going to be honest, Craig. I know you're not yep. the one doing this, but. I don't know. I just haven't been super impressed with what St. Louis did. And I, I thought that Cincinnati really, to me, looks like a team that's on the rise. What sure. am I missing? So, th- yeah, this is interesting. So I will also note that that we run these every day. So our current ones have uh, have Chicago 81 and 81, technically, if you round. So, so there are a, a, a few slight changes there. 
Um, so St. Louis, I, th- I I was talking about this with, with someone else online the day that we released these standings. And I think what people can struggle to, to look at and say, like, St. Louis isn't 14 games better than they were last year. Well, that's true. But what any statistical model is going to say is that they weren't actually a 71-win team last year. Not on talent. Not on a talent basis, right? Well, obviously, they gave up a lot more, more runs than they scored. That's a recipe for losing games. But if you go up and down their lineup at any projections, I think Fangraphs released theirs. They're right around the same, 84 wins maybe. Wilson Contreras can hit. Paul Goldschmidt can hit. Nolan Arenado, maybe not as well as he used to, but can still hit, right? Jordan Walker projects to hit very well still. You you, you go up and down the entire lineup, and you're going to get those, you know, all of those guys can hit. I think I looked, uh, they have more than uh, nine batters projected at league average or better. Well, that's really hard to go through as an opposing pitcher. You know, maybe there's no, individual guy like Aaron judge who will, who will kill you. Maybe there's not someone exactly like that, but there are a number of really good offensive players and they'll just wear you down. The, you know, Lars Newtbar is again, maybe not a killer, but top of that lineup, strong OBP again, wears you, makes you throw a lot of pitches, wears you down. The other thing they did, obviously they added Sonny Gray. That's a big improvement on their pitching side. Now is adding Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson, a big improvement. I would say no. (laughs) I would say no, but one of the big things that killed them last year was their depth, right? How many, how many innings their backups and backups to their backup starters, their their seventh, eighth, ninth starters had to throw last year. So even if Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson are marginally worse than average, if they're in the four and five spot and just eating up innings, protecting the bullpen, that kind of thing, there's a lot of value in that. That doesn't mean it's good innings, but it's still it can be volume innings and and that can be worth something and the uh, the last thing they did was their bullpen actually got substantially better um it 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 was it that's a low bar to clear (laughs) you know they they weren't very good but giovanni gallegos ryan helsley even jojo romero uh projects to pitch very well for them uh and and then they added keenan middleton they added you know they added some guys who can miss bats here and there generate ground balls which they obviously have always liked uh andrew kittredge people aren't going to put a lot of value in his name there's not a lot of name value there but he can miss bats when he's healthy and he's always missed bats when he's healthy and they picked him up so it's it's things like that for st louis that that bring them up for for cincinnati and i'll i'll be brief they've got a lot of really young hitters some of them were really really good matt mcclain tremendous season but again if you look at the underlying stuff the the exit velocities how often he's putting the ball on the ground you wouldn't normally project a five uh 500 slug so he gets regressed a little bit ellie de la cruz might be the most exciting player in baseball he really fell off after a really hot start in June. And so he's got a short track record of not great play. So the projection isn't going to be that great. Uh, they also, their playing time is very uh, up in the air, let's say. You know, they brought in Jamer Candelario. They already had, I would say, five or six infielders, right? They're playing Spencer Steer in the outfield. Jonathan India, where's he going to play? Where is Noel V. Marte going to play? It, you know, how much playing time are all these guys going to get? So I think certainly an ascendant club who went out and got some pitching, but Frankie Montas, who knows how many innings, who knows what quality, Nick, you know, Nick Martinez, actually probably a pretty good fit for that park. But a lot of the pitching additions, Emilio Pagan is a really fly ball pitcher. You throw him in the bullpen <laughs> in that park. I don't know. You know, so it's, it's, we'll see. I think a lot of it will come down to pitching health for them. Nick Lodolo, Hunter Green, uh, those guys need to stay healthy to give them a shot. Now, you guys also at Baseball Perspective have these really cool simulated wins by percentage by teams, and it's kind of like a visual representation, but could you explain that to our listeners a little bit? Yeah, I'm thrilled that you brought these up. I love these, and I probably don't even reference them enough. So these are, are what's called bridge plots. So it's it's just, it's a, like you said, the simulated win percentage is on the bottom, and Our projections are based, people always say, why do you have, you know, 80.6 wins for for your projection? Well, we run a thousand simulations every night. And so 80.6 is is just the percentage of, of you know, it's the simulated win 
uh, wins over for a 498 win percentage for the Cubs that, uh, you know, in those thousand Sims. Uh, so what this displays is all of those Sims laid out from worst to best, essentially, and how how many of them, the peak of it is obviously how many of them ended up in that win, win percentage range. So you'll see, uh, you, you can see essentially see in how many uh, the the Cubs actually end up winning more games than the Brewers, than the Cardinals, than whatever. The Cardinals have the highest number of wins, you know, f- furthest along the win percentage chart, which is why they're projected to win the division. But you can also see that there are a, a lot of scenarios where the Cubs or even the Brewers win more games than the Cardinals or the teams ahead of them in the standings. That's a, It's a really helpful graphic, I think, to, to estimate also – kind of the upside and downside of various teams. I think Pittsburgh, you can see, are so far back in terms of where the the highest point of their ridge is. But if you look at the right tail, the most successful season, it's actually pretty good. And it's not that far back from some of the other teams ahead of them. So that might be saying, on average, they're not that good a team. But because they're young, because there's some upside, you know, the, you know in, in the optimal scenario, they, they might actually not be too bad. Like I said, you had the Brewers in third place. The Cubs, like I said, 81 wins. I could I could see that right now without making any other moves. You know, that, that seems realistic. That 84 last year, and you're taking away Stroman and Bellinger. Uh, you add Imanaga. You don't know what you got there. but So, uh, you so know. Imanaga is a huge part of it. And and I, I'm sorry for, for uh, no, no, interrupting. But I really think he's crucial to, to this projection and, and how it compares to maybe some of the other ones out there. Um, we project Imanaga. To have a DRA minus, that's our our stat, deserved run average. And and minus just puts it on, it's an index stat. So we project him to have a DRA minus of 115, which is 15% worse than league average. That's really pretty bad. Uh, So that's a very negative projection. And I'm not saying that I think that's right. What I'm saying is I think that's the reason we're lower on the Cubs by a win or two than some of these other ones. Because we have him projected for 145 innings. And if he's 15% worse than average for 145 innings, that's a lot of bad pitching, right? That's potentially like Lance Lynn, right? Just throwing him out there, eating innings, and it's bad performance. The reason we have that projection is Imanaga was a really fly ball prone pitcher in Japan. So we have his, I'm, I'm going off memory, but but uh, my recollection is we have his home run per fly ball rate at like two per nine, which is really bad, right? He And he was one of the bottom five home run per fly ball pitchers in Japan last year. Uh, I think maybe over the, it, it, across the last three years. So he gives up a lot of home runs. Now he gets swings and misses. This is not to say he's a bad pitcher. There are a lot of pitchers like this, right? That give up home runs, but you know, if, if they're in the zone and they miss their spot, it's going to go a long way. We've seen guys like that. So the question is, if we're right on that kind of translation of his stats, right? And we know major league hitters can punish the ball on in general. Again, this is generalities. A little bit more than the NPB hitters. And we know that if you make a mistake in the major leagues, not it's just not only that they're stronger or or more used to hitting for power, but just that there are the the ability to to damage the ball in general up and down a lineup is better here than it is in, in NPB. Um, so that's some of that translation. That's some of that reasoning. I think if you go look at, again, I'm going off the top of my head, but I think Zips had a different home run per nine projection and he looks like a much better pitcher. Uh, so the, and, and to me, part of it is he's landed in Wrigley, which is generally a good place to, to hit. So I am very curious how that will pay out, play out. I think he's a really good pitcher and it might be a bit of a pessimistic uh, projection, but I also understand why it's going there. Now, I saw this tweet from my friend Matt Clapp from the blog finds at the blog finds. And what he did is he went back and looked at the projected preseason by fan graphs, followed by the actual win total. So not, not apples to apples, but similar in, tw- in 2016, the projected win totals for the Brewers was 69 games and they ended up winning 73. 2017 is projected. They went 70 and they won 86. And, and so you can kind of see going all the way up other than one year, which I think they had a lot of injuries on. I'm trying to figure out which year it was. I want to say 2022. I think they're, oh, they had a lot of pitching injuries that year. 
but it seems like every year the Brewers outperformed what a lot of people expected while Craig Council was manager. Did you notice that as well? Uh, sure. I mean, like we we look at all our our track record on this stuff. Uh, it's and it's hard. There are a lot of reasons. I, Harry Pavlidis uh, is fond of saying, and I think he's he's absolutely right. Is that pr- uh, any projection is a playing time projection ultimately, and so what happens is how we're how we tend to miss in these situations is again if if Shota Imanaga is fifteen percent worse than league average every time he goes out there, which isn't how it works, but let's just pretend the Cubs probably aren't going to let him throw 145 innings. You're going to get Cade Horton in there, right? And and Cade Horton might be better. And so we're going to be wrong not only on – we might be right on performance, right, if if we're right on, on that. But we're going to be wrong on innings. And then we're going to get more Cade Horton innings than maybe we're projecting. And those might be better, right, which is why he'd stay in the lineup. There's a dynamism to all of the to, – to how how – roster decisions tend to get made, right? And I think this was one of the reasons we were often really off on St. Louis. What they were really good at, this is just a theory of mine, was cycling these guys off like they could get three great weeks of somebody, right? And then as soon as they start to hit the skids, they didn't just keep running them out there. They turned to someone else. They always had someone else to rotate in. And so you can get really far off on playing time in that way, not just on pitchers, but, you know, on, on uh on, on the position player side too, you know, Michael Bush or Matt Mervis, right? I mean, it's going to be Michael Bush, obviously early on, but if he struggles and Matt Mervis comes in and can hit, we're going to get a completely different scenario than we have. And and you can hedge your bets, right? And you can say, maybe it's 50, 50. That's not what we did, but we, let's say you did that, but then you're going to be wrong anyway. Right? So there are a lot of ways to be really wrong on this stuff. And, and it can just play out in, in so many uh, in, in so many different facets. And so the manager part of this is obviously the decisions that they tend to make. I think what Craig Council is generally is often known for is his his deftness with the bullpen. Um, I am curious how that plays out with the Cubs, not because I, I think, you know, they've made really good strides on the pitching side and had some re- really nice bullpen performances last year from guys you might not have anticipated. But the Brewers are a factory on that front right? Who is Abner Uribe? Okay. But you know, he comes out with a sub two ERA, right? And it's like, how many, they just do that with a guy every year. They have like a guy that does that. Are the Cubs going to be that way? How much of that was council's management, putting him in a position to succeed versus Brewers player development? Well, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. There's probably some sort of synergy there where they work off of each other. And so I'm interested to see what council brings to the Cubs in that regard. I think the biggest thing a manager can do is put his guys in a position to succeed, bullpen and otherwise. And I think Craig Council is one of the best managers in baseball. That's how he got that contract. That's that's no small thing. But it also depends on the talent in place and how the front office and 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 council work together to adapt what they're doing and and are on the same page and that kind of thing. And that might take a year to to iron out. I don't know, but it'll it'll be very interesting and something we're certainly watching. All right, Craig, I'm going to give you one chance to speak to the Cub fans and let them know why you think the Cubs are going to be successful this year. Why you think that the Cubs may be on that 90th percentile of wins. Why, what should Cub fans hang their hats on for a good season? <laughs> Boy, uh, putting it to me. So <laughs> I think, no, it's I, I'm not down on the Cubs, honestly. I think I, it was really interesting when, when I, I wrote an article uh, during our Pakoda week, which happened last week, about teams Pakoda likes and dislikes. And for my dislikes article, I wasn't sure how to categorize the Cubs. I knew I knew it wasn't like super positive, but I was very curious how Cubs fans felt about this team. And frankly, based on the response I got when the standings went live, it was kind of they don't know either, or like you know, it's mixed. It's mixed among the fan base, right? A lot of people are unhappy with the front office, wanted to see kind of a bigger swing. And I think that's kind of how I feel. So so it's a little hard for me to say, like, here's why they're going to do the 90, you know, here's why their 90th percentile outcome. Because this feels like a team that's missing that one superstar level player, right? Like, I'm not saying they should have traded for Juan Soto or even had the pieces to do it. But you put Juan Soto in the middle of this lineup and suddenly it feels right. Like the gravitational pull feels right. 
Whereas like now it's a little, there's no one to hold that center in that exact same way. And I'm not saying I think Cody Bellinger is the answer. He was last year. He performed like it. But there are a lot of reasons to think Cody Bellinger isn't going to be that Cody Bellinger again. And so I'm not saying the off, the front office made a mistake not going for him. But I do think someone in that vein, you know, the Cubs were just quiet, quiet, quiet throughout the offseason up until January. You know, I liked the Bush trade for them. I liked picking up Yancy Almonte. I actually think they've done a nice job like I said, with the bullpen, putting in a bunch of arms that are that are pretty interesting and, and that can work. And I think that was something that they went and got Jose Quas, uh, you know, at the, at the deadline, but they were running out of guys, right? They, they threw Mo- Marcus Stroman back there for a little bit, you know, all this kind of stuff. I, I think they kind of set themselves up to have a better situation. And I think if this, if this Cubs team is going to hit their 90th percentile projection, let's say, I, it, it, this is different than what you asked me, but I think if they're going to, it's going to be because the pitching is better than than we project it to be, than maybe I even think it is. I was not a huge fan of the Jam- Jamison Tyon signing. Uh, not that I don't like JMO, but, you know, I just, the track record there, I was a little surprised uh, at the time. But, you know, Kate Horton, I mentioned him before. I'm interested to see what he brings to the table. Jordan Wicks, what can he do? I know it's going to be the back of the bullpen, back of the rotation. I'm not saying he's like a number one starter or anything like that. It's the young guys, right? I mean, like that's that's where it'll come down to. And I think it can be the young guys in arms. Shota, Shota Imanaga, not a young guy, but a new guy, right? Like how those guys perform, I think is going to dictate this. Justin Steele, can he keep it up, not have those last six starts or so? that he had at the end of 2023 where I thought, you know, I thought maybe he's a Cy Young guy and the last six starts kind of tailed off. I I think it's going to be those guys. And you can say the same on the hitting side, right? I mean, they have so many options. What is Pete Crow Armstrong going to do? What is Michael Bush going to do? What are we going to see at third base? Are they opening a spot for Matt Shaw that quickly, right? Who knows right now? Um, There's a rambling answer to hide that I didn't have a good one. For you, but I really do think that's the case, though. I mean it. I mean it. It's rambling, and it's 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 no, it's, no. You're you're you. I'm going to tell you honestly. If you talk to most Cub fans, they're on the same boat. We don't know what yeah. this team is, and there isn't who's the guy that scares the opposing pitcher when you go down that that lineup. And is that per does that person exist? And and who knows? And so there's a lot of well, what if say a Suzuki's that guy? He was that last month, month and a half of the season. Exactly. What if this? What if that? Um, so there's a lot of, of uncertainty, I think, going into it. And all you can, can do is just say, thank God we're in the NL Central, you know. Well, thank and, God we're not in the East and thank God we're not in the West. <laughs> and here's one bit of positivity, obviously. So, look, we we had to uh, – Patrick Dubuque, one of our, our editors and authors, wrote an article last year about how we missed the Orioles by 26 games, right, <laughs> on our projections. When you make projections, you got to you gotta do stuff like that. And that, I'm serious when I say we go back and look at it. Oh, yeah. But – we missed the Orioles by 26 games. And I think everyone thought the Orioles were, were, were on the come up. Right. So, but again, when you have a short kind of statistical track record, there are wider, uh, you know, margins of error, error bars, that kind of thing. The Cubs have a lot of these young guys with relatively short track records. I mean, Pete Crow Armstrong, uh, our, our defensive projections don't like him for whatever reason. Now that's insane, Right. I mean, the guy is his gold glove quality outfielder. So the projection might not like his overall, you know, warp or whatever, his wins above replacement, but he's going to be better on the defensive side. So that's, you can already kind of erase that. It was just a small sample size kind of fluke kind of thing. He's bat. It might be right on. We have him about 15% worse than league average. We don't know what the bat will be, but these young players with very minimal track records, especially the ones that fly through the majors, Matt Shaw, or fly through the minors, excuse me. Matt Shaw, for example. Pete Crow Armstrong is an early, early, early 20s, right? It's not like he spent a lot of time in the minors. It's going to have a different kind of, uh, it's going to be more conservative with those guys than than I think uh, it would be with someone who has a longer track record in the minors. And we just, teams are changing how they matriculate guys through the system. And, and the reason I brought up the Orioles is Gunnar Henderson, right? Jordan Westberg, uh, you know, Colton Kowser, we saw for a little bit. Heston Kierstad, we saw for a little bit. They had all these guys, these young players to turn to that they, again, like the Cardinals, they could cycle through when they needed to. And also, they had relatively short track records in the minors 
that our, our system might have been a little more conservative on. And ultimately, you know, Gunnar Henderson's a five win player anyway. So, you know, you, you end up with misses like that on guys like that. So I, I think that's something that I'm not saying that the, the Cubs are set up in the exact same way. You know, Gunnar Henderson was our top overall uh, prospect last year. Uh, Adley Rutschman was the one before that. The Cubs don't have that guy, right? But we really like Matt Shaw. We, I, we really liked him in our draft coverage. And so it might not be this to the same level or to the same degree, but they do have a lot of young guys who, again, could could outproduce those kind of projections. Well, Craig, I appreciate you jumping on and giving us a little bit of background. Where can our listeners uh, read your work and find out more about Pakoda? Sure. Uh, baseballprospectus.com. We have a, a whole page that uh, our Pakoda projection page. Uh, it's got all our articles from Pakoda Week. Uh, we have a podcast where we discussed our, our standings. I was not there. I was sick, as I said. Uh, we've got this book behind me. Sorry on this side. Uh, the baseball, the, the 2024 Baseball Prospectus Annual Essays on All 30 Teams. Roy Wood Jr. Uh, wrote the Cubs essay this year, uh, plus projections. Uh, you know, the Pakota projections are in there in a stat box. We've got a comment right below it. We've got our top one-on-one prospects in there with write-ups on each guy. Nine Cubs prospects on the top 101 you know so again maybe not the orioles in terms of top guys a lot of depth though there's a lot of guys in there uh michael bush listed as a dodger because we went to press early early uh in january but he he is the guy he's he, there so there are eight listed cubs but you count michael bush it's nine uh so but we have the book that you can buy um and and again just baseballperspectus.com uh, we we do great writing, great analysis, fantasy, dynasty, prospect coverage, everything you want. It's all there. Well, Craig, thank you for jumping on. And I look forward to doing this again next year. And one of these days, you're going to come up to me with some good news, buddy. <laughs> my, my pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, man. This is the Fly the W670 podcast. It's episode 13 of season three. Why does Pakoda hate the Cubs? The 2024 edition. Don't forget. Listen, download, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Leave us a five-star review. On Thursday, Crawley was super excited as the Cubs announced their 2023 stadium giveaways. Let her rip, Crawley. Oh, my God, Dustin. I I, I, I geek out. I mean, I, I if you are watching <laughs> on the score, I am surrounded by Cubs stadium giveaways, like in my basement. I literally have the Moises Alou rubber ducky. Uh, every, every tchotchke, chia pet, everything they've ever given away, I get excited about. I don't know why I, I have a sickness, but you know, it, th- when this comes out, it, to me, it's like one of my favorite days of the year, because then I can really start planning the games that I am going to attend. And so with that, I'll give you again, a little bit of ideas of what's going to be out there and, and just make sure the best bet always get there early. You never know what the lines are going to look like. Um, and sometimes certain giveaways are certain numbered. So, for example, if you go on opening day, Cubs home opener, April 1st, April Fool's Day, the return of the magnet schedule. There were people furious the last couple of seasons. The magnet schedule was not available. People take them from every year they can and put them on their beer fridge. And so the 2024 Cubs magnet schedule is available. It looks like an old school um, scorecard. It looks awesome, and it's available for the first 30,000 fans. So you could be a little bit later to this one, spend a little bit more time in your favorite drinking establishments, whether it's Murphy's or Lucky Doors or Output, wherever you want to go. But uh, don't wait too long because you don't want to be shut out. But, Dustin, I've been around a long time, and I have seen some great Cubs giveaways. I have a Washburn guitar. Um, I mean, there there's just been so many good ones, but when I saw this one, this one almost broke the internet, Dustin. This is the Pat Hughes <laughs> sweater shirt for the yeah. first early 10,000 arriving fans on Saturday, April 6th. This one, I'm telling you right now, he everyone knows about his sweaters. Uh, Ron Santo has brought it up. Uh, Ron Coomer has brought it up. Um, it pays homage to Mr. Patrick Virgil Hughes's fashion sense. And this is about one of the ugliest sweaters you ever seen cub colors, cub logo. But I'm telling you this one, if you don't get early to that, Dustin, that's going to be gone. That's right. going to, that's going to be a, a real popular one among the collectors. Weren't those, uh, it was, it was a Coogie. Was that the brand in the nineties? 
Was it the Kugi sweater that everybody wore to the Bulls <laughs> yeah. games, right? Yeah. Those? yeah, they were not was really the ugly, brand? like yeah. the Bill Cosby-ish. Yeah, uh-huh. like somebody like threw paint at a wall and it was running down. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. I got to see Pat wearing this. This is this is going to be great. But um, the other giveaway, this one's a fun one here, is, is the fleece blanket. I always love the fleece blanket. But once again, they did an excellent job of this. It looks like one of the old vintage scorecards with a 1930s bear logo on it for the first 10,000 fans. And, you know, those games in April, those are the ones, this is for April 20th, Saturday. Um, when you're talking about Saturday, April 20th, I mean, you want to have a nice blanket to kind of keep you warm, right? Well, who doesn't like a, who doesn't like a blanket, especially a free blanket. Now, if you are a Cub fan and you got the little ones, they do have something special that year that are pretty cool. These are Clark the Cub plushies. And there's a series of five, one, two, threes. There's six of them in different Cubs jerseys. So the top half is Clark. The bottom half is different jerseys. Um, there's a Cubs home jersey, a 1979 jersey, a Sandberg 84 jersey, a Cubs road jersey, and the blue Cub home alternates. Another set, Dustin, that they're doing are the tank tops. And these are sick. I'm uh, absolutely. I, I knew you'd have your eyes out for those. Oh, man. I, gun, sun's out, guns out, right? And so uh, when you're looking at the tank tops, again, they're only. So the plushies are for the first 5,000 kids. So not 10,000. You got to be there early for that. And the tank tops are only available in the Budweiser bleachers. Okay. But the tank tops are meant to look like Cubs jerseys and they look sick. 1911, 1929, 1937, 1978, the famous 1984 and the 89 jerseys. But these Dustin, I, I got to get all of them. I got to collect them all. That, that's <laughs> that, that's what's got to happen. I love it. Now I love it. Here we go. For the, I'm going to turn the, my, my camera on this one because now we're getting into my wheelhouse, the bobbleheads. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cubs have outdone themselves because the bobbleheads this year look pretty awesome. Uh, first up, Dustin, on June 1st, Christopher Morrell. And let me put this up here for you, Dustin. We'll describe it to the listeners. It is from the walk-off home run he hit against the White Sox where he ripped his jersey off. And so, Dustin, this bobblehead has a removable jersey. So I've never seen that before. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know if you can put it on him, take him off but I will definitely be getting one of those. June 22nd, Adbert Alzali and his fist pump that he does after every victory. These, these bobblehead, these mock-ups look really, really good. Sometimes, Dustin, you're like, who is that player? These absolutely look exactly like the guy. Yeah, they um, look nice. Yeah. How many do you think one, you got back there? Like 200. <laughs> oh, now, on June 23rd, this excited me. For the Sandberg game, the Sandberg statue dedication ceremony. If right. you remember last year, Dustin, they did statue bobbleheads. And so they are going to continue that theme with the Sandberg so that you can add it to your collection. On August 1st, Justin Steele gets his first Cubs bobblehead. Look at that. It wrapped yeah. in the American flag. I like that from, the flag. Yep. From Lucidale, Mississippi. Looks great. Dustin, there, there has been a little bit of bobblehead controversy. Ian Happ has been on the team since 2017, and he's never had his own bobblehead. Huh. Okay. Uh, Nick Madrigal bobblehead. Nico Horner bobblehead. Uh, Marcus Stroman bobblehead. Never an Ian Happ. And everyone was like, well, what did Ian Happ do wrong? Well, he's got his own bobblehead. Not only does he have his own bobblehead, they have interchangeable accessories. He has a coffee cup, uh, a baseball bat, and a mitt. So how this works, I don't know. But but I, I am excited. Um, and then on the 4th of July, Dustin, people are not going to believe me when I say this. This is one of the biggest giveaways right here. It is the oh, yeah. Hawaiian Shirt Day. First 10,000 to the ballpark, get it. And again, I had a buddy last year. He said to me, Crawley, I want to buy tickets for that game. I said, yeah, no problem. You got them. He sits there and he calls me up the next day. Well, they, they, they ran out. I'm like, you didn't get there early enough. Well, there was a huge line. I'm, that's That's it. Early bird gets the worm. So if you want the Hawaiian shirt, don't sit there dawdling around. You better get into the ballpark as quick as you can. Um, some other interesting dates, Dustin. Friday, September 6th, 7th, 8th is the Cubs Hall of Fame weekend. So they're going to have some different pins. Last year, the pins were a big double pin of um, Dunstan and Grace. This year, it's going to be of Wood and Aramis. And it's going to be the same setup. One day is going to be to celebrate Kerry Wood. 
The other day is going to be to celebrate um, Aramis Ramirez. And then Sunday is going to be when they get their plaques, when they throw out the first pitches and when they get the blue jackets. So you want to be looking for those tickets for that weekend of September 6th, 7th, 8th. I also, I also think that's when the Yankees are in town. No, oh, boy. Wild. That'll be a wild, wild weekend. Well, it's really, it's really uh, nice to see what uh, fans can get their hands on and hopefully Crowley will get his hands on all of it. Also uh, some Sandberg news to share. Yeah. You know, obviously we've talked about the Sandberg statue dedication ceremony. It's still on for what I, you know, as far as I know for June 23rd, the anniversary of the Sandberg game, and they're going to be flying in Dustin, a ton of his teammates, so I think anybody like in our age bracket, Dustin, of the 80s, 90s, Cub fans are, are definitely going to want to be at Wrigley for those games. Um, but but Sandberg, as we know, has been battling prostate cancer that has metastasized. And so on Instagram, he has been giving updates. And so this is the update that he just gave that, you know, he's he's doing OK. Um, he's going for through chemo, but, you know, he's just trying to kind of encourage people to stay strong and and. And that he's going to keep, you know, fighting this disease. So it, it's, you know, it's good because if you're following Rhino on Instagram, there's pictures of him out and about. Um, and you just you just want him to be healthy and hopefully beat this thing. Absolutely. That's all you want to do. But modern medicine, um, a lot of good people have fought in it. And a lot of, you know, he's got a got a good shot, I think. He's got a good shot. Absolutely. And again, it's I, if you have the opportunity and you have the means to get to that game, the 23rd for that statue dedication ceremony, our good friend Lucella, uh, you know, he, he does the best statues. I mean, that statue was just unbelievable. And for us, Dustin, to see one of our icons being honored, I think it's this is just going to be a very special day. Absolutely. Well, that's a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download, review and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Follow on all the socials, Facebook Instagram. You can email Crawley and I fly the W670 at gmail.com. Who knows? You might get your email answered right here on the podcast. And you can watch us on YouTube by subscribing to the 670 the score YouTube channel. Pitchers and catchers report on Thursday. Go Cubs. Hey guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!